Thank you very much, Monsignor, and thank you very much for coming. Um, we, the invitation went out to some of our other um, Christian brothers and sisters from some of the other denominations in this area as well. And uh, in case that they're here tonight, I would like to personally welcome you. Um, thank God, one of the great things that's happened since the Second Vatican Council for Catholics is that uh, we now look at our Christian brothers and sisters with eyes of joy and welcome to one family, one faith, one Christ, one baptism. And uh, that's a long way from where the Catholics used to be. I can vividly remember the time that an aunt of mine got a new set of neighbors moved into her and in, next to her house. And I can remember my auntie saying to my mother and to her sisters, you know, those wonderful people next door, they're not Catholic, but they're very nice. <laughs> as though this came as a terrible shock. And I've now discovered that my Presbyterian and my uh, Anglican Episcopalian, um, they used to say the th same thing about us, that they're Catholic, but they're lovely. So that was said all round. So I'm delighted if we have some of our friends from some of the other Christian churches here. We're all on the same mission with Christ to Easter this year. What I'd like to do tonight and tomorrow night is to have a look at movies that we pray by. And I want to begin, though, with looking at the overall picture. Now, I did an exercise like this with you a couple of years ago, but it's a different list this year. And you're going to be asked two questions straight off the bat. What were the top films last year? And what were the top 10 box office films in the USA of all time, but indexed for inflation? Because if it's just the recent films, then, you know, they're just, they, they all dominate that list. But if you go back and have a look at them within their economic period, there are some wonderful, wonderful surprises. So talk to all your friends, and if you haven't met them, introduce yourself around. And we've not got a lot of time on this, but what were the big films last year? And then what were the big films that were indexed for inflation? Some of the most famous films of all time. Have a chat among yourselves, we'll put it all together in a minute. Okay, let's put all this together. I know that's a hopelessly inadequate time for this exercise, but the top 10 box office films last year were Black Panther, The Avengers, Infinity War, Incredibles 2, Jurassic World, Fallen Kingdom, Aquaman, Deadpool 2, Dr. Zeus, The Gringe, Mission Impossible, Fallout, Ant-Man and the Wasp, Solo, A Star Wars Story. Now, I'm guessing that a good number of people in this church didn't see most of those films. <laughs> but I can see a couple of people under 25 and you saw a very large number of them. Well done, we'll be back to why that matters. Venom, Bohemian Rhapsody, A Star Is Born, Ralph Breaks the Internet, A Quiet Place, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, Crazy Rich Asians, Mary Poppins Returns, Hotel Transylvania 3, Summer Vacation, Fantastic Beasts, The Crimes of Grindelwald, Halloween is number 21, and then we go to uh, The Meg, Ocean's 8, Ready Player One, Bumblebee, Mamma Mia, Here We Go Again, The Nun, Creed 2, Peter Rabbit, and The Mule. Now, chances are you didn't see most of those, but the only religious film there is The Nun, and I want to talk about that down at Congress. But because uh, I do a, a workshop at Congress called God at the Movies, and I have a look at the religious themes of the cinema in the previous years, spiritual, religious, and sometimes explicitly so. So last year, for instance, we had Paul the Apostle, we had Mary Magdalene, and we had the nun. We should really apologize to religious women in the church. The way they're portrayed is terrible on the whole. It's really awful. I want to go back to Audrey Hepburn in The, in the, the Nun. What was it called? The Nun's Story. Fantastic. They got a better time there. Um, it was really awful. And what's worse is it was a horror film. There you go. That was on cue. It was a horror film, and, uh, um, and in, in this film, it's, it kept saying it was based on a true story. That's a convent I'm not going to anytime soon, I can assure you. So, a couple of interesting things to say here, though. There are no R-rated films there. So, there are no R-18, anyway. So, be, we've got to be careful about this. We tend to say only sex and violence sells at the cinema. 
Well, it doesn't actually. If you want to make a very successful film, make it as family friendly as you can. There are a couple of, you know, pretty serious ones there, like R15 and R17, but there are no R18s there. Um, and a couple of things to, do, to note is there are 10 science fantasies. That's huge. It has been now in the cinema for 25 years. We've talked about this before. But think about it. These are some young people who are never coming near church are going to the cinema like there's no tomorrow in uh, trying to um, talk about other things, other worlds, other modes of existence, spiritual angels, um, and we've got the biggest story about this world and the next. Um, ten science fantasies. The others are five animations, two dramas, one romantic comedy, and one musical. Now, when we go and have a look at this one, boy, does it completely change, and it's marvellous. The number one film of all time indexed for inflation is Gone with the Wind. Chances are you got that. Number two is Star Wars. The Sound of Music. How do you solve a problem like Maria? Now, they were nice nuns, weren't they? We like those nuns. They helped them escape the Nazis. Isn't that fantastic? But do you know that I once, uh, you know, one of the lovely songs in uh, The Sound of Music was Edelweiss, Edelweiss. Fine, wonderful. Do you know I was once on a Sound of Music tour, which you can do, some of us have done it, in, in, uh, in Salzburg, the Sound of Music tour. If you, it's so kitsch, it's wonderful. Make sure you do it. And they put on the soundtrack, and we all sing it going around all the sites where the film was made. It was fantastic. But um, a fellow Australian of mine said, uh, when they said, oh, what do you know about Austria? And he said, I know the national anthem and started singing Edelweiss. <laughs> we have a little way to go with education in Australia. The Sound of Music and Edelweiss. So I think Rodgers and Hammerstein wrote that. Uh, so I don't think it's the national anthem of Austria. Um, E.T., Extraterrestrial from 1982. Then we go to Titanic in 1997. I've got to tell you a slightly rude story about Titanic. I went to see Titanic and I was with a whole group of friends and we absolutely had to buy, sit in the seats that we were given because it was, the theater was absolutely packed. And my seat was the middle of the middle block of the entirely packed um, cinema. And very early on, of a, what is a very long film, I really wanted to go to the bathroom. I really wanted to go to the bathroom. By the time we had all that water and that iceberg, I just wanted that ship to sink. <laughs> for some reason, climbing over those people there and climbing over those people there, that wasn't going to work for me. I oh, we know how it finishes, Leonardo. Die, please, die. <laughs> So I have vivid memories of 1977, the Ten Commandments. Isn't that terrific? Then we go to Jaws, boom, 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 boom. That's all you have to do, and we're back there. Dr. Shivago. Somewhere, my love, there will be songs to sing. The Exorcist in 1973. Oh, my God, that was a rather frightening film. But you cannot make these lists up. Straight after The Exorcist, what's the next film? Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. <laughs> Don't you just love it? I love this. The Exorcist is next to Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Then we go over to Star Wars, uh, The Force Awakens, 101 Dalmatians from 1961, Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back, Ben-Hur in 59, Avatar in 2009, Star Wars, anyone getting the idea the Star Wars franchise is a rather big franchise? Then we've got Jurassic Park, Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace, uh, The Lion King, and indeed The Sting from 1974, Raiders of the Lost Ark. And then the final group, just to tease it right out, The Graduate, Fantasia, Jurassic World, The Godfather in 1972, Forrest Gump ran for his life in 94, Mary Poppins, the 1964 version, Grease in 78, Avengers in 2012, and Black Panther just last year. Now, why do I think all of that matters? Because of the role of imagination in the Christian life. Imagination has had a fairly complex time in Christian faith over the years. It's been held in deep suspicion, and yet some of the greatest saints, mystics, prayers, theologians have been some of our most imaginative people. And that's why a few years ago, I'm now going to flog the books, um, I wrote a book called Movies That Matter. I think we should take the cinema very, very seriously. You've heard me say before. So I tried to pick 50 films that I thought matter to Christians 
The Godfather series, they're not all easy films, but I think what they might reveal to us can be quite important and quite helpful. So movies that matter. And the reason that I wrote that is to try and encourage us to be as creative we can um, with the way that the images by which we pray and the way we use our imagination. Some of us have read that great play, St. Joan, from George Bernard Shaw, where St. Joan of Arc says, how else can God speak to us except through our imaginations? As you know, Joan had extraordinary experiences of, uh, of, of seeing Christ and being called by Christ to um, lead the French army. And she was an extraordinary woman. Do you know that she was um, excommunicated in uh, uh, 1431 and burnt at the stake the next day. We canonized her and apologized for burning her at the stake in 1920. That was a long time coming, wasn't it? 489 years it took us to see she was actually one of the great mystics and one of the great martyrs of our time. And she held the, uh, the imagination in such strong stead. But a great person who writes in this area, he's now dead sadly, is a Protestant theologian called Martin Borg who wrote a terrific book called The God We Never Knew. And he says in that book, tell me your image of God and I'll tell you your theology. So what are we working out of? What's our image of God? Now some people are much more visual than others. So for some people when we say, oh imagine Jesus or imagine God the Father or imagine that scene in the gospel, some people are a lot better at that than others. But nonetheless, all of us, I think, need to tap into our imaginations as richly as we can, because this is one of the great gifts God has given us. And in the Bible, we have 230 names for God. There's not just one. Sometimes we can get it down to Father, Son, and Spirit, and it's clearly very rich indeed for Christians, but there are actually 230 names, and they come under three categories. There are three different categories for images of God and therefore our prayer in the Bible. The first is that of a political leader, the king, the lawgiver, the judge, the warrior. Then we have someone who is part of our day-to-day -day life, a father, a mother, potter, homemaker, doctor, shepherd, friend, lover, a woman about to give birth, gardener and healer. All of those are given as images about who God is for us. And some of those, for some of you, could be very rich indeed to explore this Lent. And then, of course, and naturally, we have that of nature, where we find God in light and breath, a rock, the mountaintop, clouds, fire as a shield, a bear, a lion, or eagle. God's called all of these things at various points, particularly in the Psalms with uh, the nature uh, analogies. And the mountaintop, of course, is one of the most famous indeed. So the one about mother, though, can still be a very difficult one indeed. There are still some people who get a bit worked up if ever they hear any feminine imagery for God because they'll say, well, Jesus called God our Father, that's the end of that. But our language never captures God. It never definitively captures God. God is greater than anything we can ever say. So if someone wants to pray to God our Mother, let them be and let them do it because maybe praying to their Father God is very complex for a lot of complex reasons. And we need to be careful when we talk about God our Father, we're talking about God our perfect Father in heaven. But I want to tell you a story about God our Mother. I told it a couple of years ago, but it's worth retelling tonight. My, um, I was a, a deacon. My first appointment as a priest 26 years ago was at the red light district of Sydney called King's Cross. So women in prostitution, boys in prostitution, street kids, runaways, alcoholics, homeless people, that was our ministry in the parish. And I was 29 years of age and I had a 71-year-old Irishman was the parish priest, Father Donald Taylor, a wonderful Jesuit. And Donal and I were very good friends. But when the Irish really like you, one of the signs of affection is they like having a rise out of you, particularly in public. Well, Donald must have loved me dearly because every opportunity he did, he had another go and another dig and another rise out of me. We used to have our staff meetings on Thursday morning where all the staff would get together, the lay staff with all the, the four Jesuits, and we'd pray over the readings and talk about what was coming on this coming Sunday. And, uh, and they were really rich times of prayer and meditation. And we'd often talk about what we're going to preach about this Sunday, and other people would give you really good suggestions as well. Well, coming up was Trinity Sunday, the Feast of the Most Holy Trinity. So it must have been about mid-year in June it often comes. 
And uh, I was down as the deacon to preach at all the masses that Sunday. After the prayer and meditation, Father Donald turned to me and he said, and what new fangled theology are we going to get from the young deacon this Sunday about the Holy Trinity? I can hardly contain my excitement at the absolute gems that are going to drop out of the pulpit about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Oh, give us a curtain raiser. Give us a taster right here, right now, at the magnificent things you're going to see on Sunday. And I said, well, actually, Donald, I'm going to, I have thought about what I'm going to preach about. And I think I'm going to get into the pulpit and say that while God our Father is a privileged name for God, it doesn't exhaust the possibilities, so we should be able to call God our Mother as well as God our Father. Father Donal never said, no, don't do it. He used to say, I'd be slow on that one. <laughs> it took me three and a half years to work out that that was his version of no, don't do it. So I didn't take wise advice wisely. So there I was, the deacon at the, uh, at the vigil mass. We had uh, all the normal parishioners in. We had a big Catholic girls boarding school close by, and they still are, and the boarders still come over for their mass on Saturday night during term time. So I had 140 adolescent girls sitting in the church as well. And then I had in the front row Con, the most famous alcoholic and homeless person in King's Cross. He came to absolutely everything. He was our leading parishioner. Normally he would come for any tea, biscuits, alcohol, or anything that was served after mass or whatever, but he used to go to sleep, we thought, during the mass. So I started, I got into the pulpit and I started to give out God our mother. And about two minutes into that homily, Con sprang off the front pew and said, God's not our mother. God's not our mother. Mary's our mother, and God's our father. And then he turned to Father Donal, who was saying the Mass, I'm the deacon. He said, Father Donal, this idiot hasn't got a clue. <laughs> then he looked back at the congregation. He said, if you're listening to this BS, he didn't say BS, but if you get my drift, if you're listening to this BS, you need your head read, and with that walked out of the church. At that moment, 140 adolescent girls sat there saying, this is the best mass I have ever been at. <laughs> the drunk took on the priest and won. I looked at the congregation. He, uh, they were just hysterical with laughter. I looked over at Father Donal. He had tears coming down his cheeks. And I looked back and said to the congregation, the only thing that could be said in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. When I walked back and sat down next to Father Donald, he leant over to me and he said, I told you to be slow on that one. <laughs> so we've got to be a bit careful about our images. Martin Borg's on the money, this great American theologian. Tell me your image of God and I'll tell you your theology. So that's why the life of imagination matters so much. Well, rather than just talk about it, I now want to practice what I preach and show you the first of two clips we're going to watch tonight. And I want to show you a, f a film that many of you would have seen. Who's seen The Shawshank Redemption? It's on television every three weeks. So, um, so let me set it up so that you know those of you who haven't seen it, which is rather willful if you haven't seen this film, because it is a beautiful film. In 1947, Andy Dufresne is wrongly convicted of his wife's murder and sentenced to life in prison at Shawshank Penitentiary, run by the God-fearing Warden Norton. In time, he's befriended by a fellow lifer, Red, uh, Morgan Freeman, wonderful role, and he's the great fixer of the jail. From the outset, the Warden uses Andy's accountancy skills uh, as a businessman to make a small fortune from the prison industries. In 1966, Norton discovers that Andy actually is innocent of the murder, and so he has the informant killed to keep Andy in jail so he can keep making money. Andy plots his escape from that day on, and then tells Red that if ever he gets probation, he can meet him on the beach in Mexico. Now, I have to, what I've done with this clip is there is a swear word there which I have silenced, so it's not coming, for those who have particularly, I'm conscious of our young people here, but there is a slight crudity which I did miss. Now, don't let the trees get in road to the front of the woods. You're in, sometimes we can get terribly hung up on what is a crude moment, which is inappropriate, we don't encourage it, but the morality of this film and its heart is absolutely in the right place. Let's watch 16 minutes and 44 seconds of the Shawshank Redemption. 
James. Not long after the warden deprived us of his company, I got a postcard in the mail. It was blank, but the postmark said Fort Hancock, Texas. Fort Hancock, right on the border. That's where Andy crossed. When I picture him heading south in his own car with the top down, it always makes me laugh. Andy Dufresne, who crawled through a river of shit and came out clean on the other side. Andy Dufresne, headed for the Pacific. <laughs> Hadley's got him by the throat, right? And he says, those of us who knew him best talk about him often. I swear the stuff he put... We'll get the lights on. The word redemption comes from the Latin word redemptio, which means to buy back. And it's obviously a very, very Christian word. It's a very theological word. And St. Paul talks about it in Romans chapters 2, 4, and 7 when he says that Christ is our redeemer, Christ redeemed us. The word redemption was, redemptio was buying back in, in, the, in Jesus' day because of the way they dealt with criminals. There were two ways that you got punished as a criminal in Jesus' day. You were sent into slavery to the family you had offended, or, um, or you're in the class of slaves for your whole life, that you were um, the slaves had to be set free. Two ways you could be set free is what I wanted to say. The first was that you could pay the ransom to the other family and set them free, or you could send your own slave in and they could take their place and then that person has been set free. St. Paul says this is what happened to all of us in the death of Jesus, that we had, were ransomed to sin, but we'd been set free by Christ, both taking our place and then facing down death, that death be no more, and also that the ransom has been paid, the price of our sinfulness has been paid, we have been set free. And so Stephen King calls this novella the Shawshank Redemption, and there are some beautiful quotes in it. Andy Dufresne, who crawled through a river and came out clean on the other side. There's a harsh truth to face. No, I'm not going to make it on the outside. All I think of doing anymore is break my parole, so maybe they'd send me back. Terrible thing to live in fear. All I want to be back is be, be back where things make sense, where I won't have to be afraid all the time. Only one thing stops me, a promise I made to Andy. Remember, Red, hope is a good thing, maybe the best of things, and no good thing ever dies. I think it's the excitement only a free man can feel, a free man at the start of a long journey whose conclusion is uncertain. I hope I can make it across the border. Sorry, that was the next one. And then get busy living or get busy dying. And then finally, I hope to see my friend shake his hand. I hope the Pacific is as blue as it has been in my dreams. I hope. If ever Lent was about anything, it's the journey to hope. It's the journey for hope, it's the journey with hope. We're not optimistic as Christians, we're hopeful people because the Lord has redeemed us. And a couple of points that this film makes so strongly, we have to keep staring down our sinful history and trust that God's mercy always leads us on to the journey to freedom, to life, to Christ. Pope Francis said in the year of mercy, and it was probably my favorite quote that year, there is nothing we have ever done for which God's mercy is not greater. It's especially difficult to remain faithful, hopeful, and loving when we've been treated unjustly or unfairly. And as some of you know, my own sister was a wonderful woman who gave her life looking after the poor and ended up in a freakish car accident, a quadriplegic for 28 years, and Tracy died two years ago next week. That was incredibly unjust, ridiculously unfair, and yet, as you've heard me say before, she was one of the most hopeful, loving, and faithful people I could possibly have known. Red goes to, uh, Red knows where to find Andy because Andy's prepared the place for him and gone ahead of him, just as exactly the same in John's Gospel where Christ prepares the place for us, guides our journey by being our way, the map, our truth in and through the church, and our life in and through the word and the sacraments. And I love even the trees. Red goes to the tree of knowledge and it becomes the tree of life, which is in actual fact the story even of Easter. 
So in Genesis 2, if you eat of the fruit of the tree, then you will be like God. So it's our temptation to original sin. And then, but it's a tree, the cross, which becomes, in fact, our lifeline, literally our lifeline. So we're born of the tree of knowledge, and, but through Easter, we come to be alive through the tree of life. Red meets Andy on the beach, and Jesus is everywhere in the Gospels on the beach, particularly in John 21, where he meets his disciples and sets them free at last to go on mission. And then the final entire task of the Christian life is not about being bound up in rules and laws, but being set free to be our best, our most loving, generous, and authentic selves. I've got a second film for us to pray by now. Who here has seen the great film, The Truman Show? Who's seen The Truman Show? Peter Weir, an Australian director, did it. Ed Harris, Jim Carrey, got nominated for an Oscar for it. An extraordinary film. But just for those of you who don't know the story, Truman Burbank is the only person who doesn't know he's the star of the highest rating TV show in the world, The Truman Show. Do you know, um, when they made this uh, film in 1998, it looked absurd that you could possibly do this to someone, all this reality television later, this is not looking so crazy anymore, that you would go this far. And uh, so everything in his life is fake, but he doesn't know it. And he's got a huge audience all around the world. And we see them watching this show, um, his fans at a bar at home, and one of them even having a bath while watching The Truman Show. He he's, lives in a biosphere, and they've given him a phobia about water to keep him on the island. And his life is controlled by Christoph, the director in the sky. Wonderful performance by Ed Harris. And Truman isn't happy with his life, and then he's starting to get a bit restless and unhappy. And so they hire a woman to be his girlfriend and fall in love with him. And indeed, she does fall in love with him. And she's the first person to start to tell him that his life is a complete facade and everybody is hired as an actor for this international television show. So they have to get her out of the show immediately because she's about to spill the beans. And Truman is told that she's gone and moved over the ocean to Fiji, but he's frightened of water, so he can't go. Except that true love sees him face down his phobia, get in a boat to get to Fiji, but Christoph thinks otherwise. So Truman has to choose between staying with the comfortable and the not, what he knows and making a bid for freedom. We want to pick it up where he's on that mission. Let him die in front of a live audience. He was born in front of a live audience. St. Paul says that the task of the Christian life is to stare down, well, one of the tasks of the Christian life is to stare down fear. Perfect love drives out fear. Now, we're all frightened of various things, but it can be crippling. And Christoph needed to keep Truman frightened to keep him manipulated to do his bidding. But actually, what's challenging about that is the way they portray Christoph in the sky is what some people actually believe of God. That he's generally good, but then he can turn on a dime and be very nasty. There are three things that are said in the New Testament about God's nature. God is light, God is life, and God is love. Particularly in St. John's letters we find this, but of God's nature. God's not nasty in the control room queuing the weather. God is life, God is light, God is love. Because it's absolutely impossible for us to trust and love an unpredictable tyrant. Nobody loved Saddam Hussein. You had to, and no one loves that madman in North Korea. They all turn up and do all the performance and go through the motions as though they do, but nobody does. They do it to survive. You survive a tyrant. You don't love them. And sometimes, maybe even in Lent, it's a good opportunity for us to check our image of God that we're not loving a tyrant. We're loving a God of life and love and uh, light. 
God doesn't, hasn't created us to be playthings um, for God's amusement. So God's not like Christoph in the sky. We're not there being pushed around. God's in fact given us free will, the ability to be able to choose. And this has been fairly difficult in theology over the years because to what degree are we free and to what degree does God allow us to be free? Well, we actually believe God's given us complete freedom even to reject God. And there was a big fight in theology called free will and grace that came down to one question. Could Mary have said no to the angel? And the Dominicans and the Jesuits have been fighting about this for the last 470 years. You think you have arguments with your friends and neighbors, come join religious life. We fight for centuries. And it came down to that question. The Dominicans say no, such is the grace of the Immaculate Conception. Our Lady had to say yes to the angel. The Jesuit tradition says, no, there's nothing in the Immaculate Conception that took Our Lady's freedom away. In fact, what makes the yes better is she could have said no. Now, thank God she didn't, but she could have said no. But she said yes, and she was fully free to say no, but she said yes. Now, Pope Clement VII in 1743 said to the Jesuits and the Dominicans, you're both right, now shut up. <laughs> and the Jesuits are right, there's no question about that. <laughs> but we have to be careful, we are not God's marionettes. We have been given freedom, but freedom to walk to freedom. That's what I love about The Truman Show, why it's a great Lenten film. And we believe that God was so committed to us that even when we were lost and couldn't find our way to God, God became one with us in Jesus, experiencing the limitations of our life and the pain of our death. And Christ put an end to death and showed us the way to freedom to light. That uh, I love that moment. If you'd never seen the film before, when that boat slams into the set, it's confronting because everything's a facade and that's a moment of great freedom. And then when the hand goes out, which has a little echo of the Sistine Chapel, of the finger, because he's about to be reborn. How does he get reborn? In the waters of baptism. So he's gone through this terrible storm and then comes up out of the waters of baptism. It's all there for the picking if, uh, if you want it to be. And Truman's escape boat, we just had a really quick shot of it, but the back of the boat was called the Santa Maria, which was the name, of course, St. Mary was the name of Christopher Columbus, captain in 1492. And they told Columbus he would be nuts to go on that trip because you'll fall off the edge of the world. They believed the world to be flat. Well, here we've got Truman taking the risk of falling off the end of his world only to go into life, uh, to life beyond it. And finally, we believe that God's greatest enjoyment for us is to be our companion as we explore our many horizons in our lives that we're able to, and that's how we can become the true men and true women that God's created us to be. That the task of our life is to be free of fear and to embrace life and life eternal in this world and indeed in the next. These films could be a wonderfully creative, enjoyable and terrific way to prepare for Easter during Lent. You may not have ever thought of this before, but that's why in, in books like this, I've tried to guide some people's choices that they might make the best ones about what they might watch. Not everything in here would be easy watching or family watching, but some of it would be indeed. And while we're there and before we go, as you know, I wrote a book last year called What Does It All Mean? Finding God in Pain and Suffering. Some of us, if we need to get better theology, and let go of a tyrannical God. Maybe that book will help you. And then this is this year's book. I wrote this book called Hatch, Match and Dispatch, A Catholic Guide to Sacraments. And I wanna talk about that um, on Wednesday night. And so hopefully you'll be with me. I think that what we've looked at tonight in the life of the imagination might be to set some people free to think about the images of God they use, because that's your theology, and then indeed to embrace something that might be the freest, most life-giving that we can. That's the task of every Lent. Not just to do extra penance and while we should repent of our sins, no question, it's actually more positive. The church says it's a season of joy to move into freedom in Christ at Easter. So I want to finish tonight's session because we'll be back to talk more about this tomorrow night. I want to finish tonight's session by doing what priests do best and blessing you and blessing your wonderful God-given imagination. The reason we walk to freedom, the reason we have hope, is because we can trust one great truth. 
He's got the whole world in his hands. 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 He's got you and me, brother, in his hands. He's got you and me, sister, in his hands. He's got you and me, brother, in his hands. He's got the whole world 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 in his hands. And that, my brothers and sisters, leads us to freedom, to Christ and to life. May we be blessed, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks very much.